So hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Good, I'm the author of Five Little Indians and the uh, J.V. Klein lecturer for Green College this year. I'll, I'll let everybody know that we've been having a little bit of technical difficulties, and so we might all disappear or we might <laughs> have some sound troubles. And if that's the case, um, just hang in and uh, we'll... Um, will uh, uh, it'll probably be me that disconnects and, and reconnects to the zoom to the zoom link and we'll we'll carry on and we'll just do the best that we can. Um, I'm very pleased to have Jessica McDermott with us tonight and uh, maybe you can tell me right now Jessica if uh, if I've still got the slow talk going on or is it or is it working okay? So far so good. Okay, great. So um, we have with us Jessica McDermott, who is a journalist and an author. I'm so pleased that she could join us tonight. And um, our theme tonight is the, the role of allies, the role that allies play in promoting reconciliation in a meaningful sense. And so, uh, first of all, what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask Jessica to just Introduce herself. Introduce yourself, Jessica, in terms of your your background, your journalistic work, and of course, um, the writing of your phenomenal work, um, Highway of Tears, about the missing and murdered women along Highway 16, etc. And so, if um, if I could ask you to just take the floor for that, please. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks so much for uh, for having me here to, to have this conversation. It's really an honor to speak to you about this. Um, so I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for ooh, <laughs> getting close to 20 years now. Um, and, uh, you know, through my career, I covered bas basically everything under the sun, but, but always was most interested in human rights issues and sort of shining a light on the places that and, and the stories that people are not paying attention to and, and it's causing you know, a lot of pain and a lot of suffering in the world. Um, and, and sort of with the belief that you know, if people know the truth of what's happening, if they know the truth, then there's at least a chance that it will be, that some of these things will be addressed. Um, and so I had worked overseas for, for a few years in West Africa and then when I'd come home and I, I ended up back in BC in Smithers, which is halfway along the Highway of Tears where I grew up, uh, and talking to people and, and, you know, and I'd been aware of the issues of the Highway of Tears for, for many, many years. It was going on as I was growing up there. And I could never understand why there was so little attention paid to it, you know, even in the, com the communities themselves and then certainly with a wider audience, you know, province-wide or nationwide, you've heard very little about it. And um, so the idea of a book about it had been in my mind for a long time. And, uh, and I eventually, you know, got to the point where I could go back and uh, live there for four or five years and be sort of totally immersed in the story and do the book Highway of Tears, which came out almost exactly two years ago. I hate to interrupt you, Jessica, but we just had a, a participant suggest that you might turn up your volume. Okay. I, well, I'm going to have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> I can hear you okay. I mean, uh, it should be just at the, the bottom right hand corner of your screen there should be a little icon yeah, that will allow you all, to it's up, it's up as loud as it will go all right we'll just have to I really computer a bit closer maybe that'll help yeah sure okay okay Lo lots of others say they can hear you just fine so that's good to know carry on sorry to interrupt you oh no that was sort of the that was kind of the end of it that was it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Okay. So, um, for those of you who haven't uh, read The Highway of Tears, and I'll, I'll just maybe ask Jessica to speak about this a little bit. It is a, it is a, a dynamic work of, of um, investigative journalism and, um, uh, and 
it serves to really unearth um, or bring to the fore the, the reality of systemic racism in Canadian institutions. And, um, you know, in particular, the RCMP, which of course we all know are the, uh, the descendant of the Northwest Mounted Police, which was a paramilitary force that was created specifically to eradicate us, <laughs> Indigenous peoples. Um, so, you know, maybe though, Jessica, you could talk a little bit about your relationships with the families of the missing women um, and how you ensured that, um, you know, that this book was um, a meaningful reflection of their experience uh, without um, capitalizing on their sorrow, without uh, taking a place at, at the head of the table, so to speak. And in that sense, how you, uh, you specifically in this work embraced um, the, the role of ally and how that's so different from some other um, experiences of people who are allying or supporting Indigenous people. So I think, I mean, setting out to do this book, I, I had years before done some research with the idea that I would do a book. And this was when I was in my early 20s and I talked to some of the families and, and I'd realized that I really, I, I wasn't ready as a person. I didn't have the skills. I, I wasn't in a place where I could do it at that time. But I had had these really incredible conversations with, with some of the family members and we'd stayed in touch over you know many, many years. So I was really lucky to sort of have them to run ideas past, to, to sort of talk to you about how to do it properly. And I mean, it's a story and, and there's so many stories when it, when it comes to indigenous communities where journalists have done a lot of additional harm in the way that they've reported on things and, and approached it in a really disrespectful way. And I really didn't want to do any of that. Um, so, I mean, I think with a book, like I, I could take a lot of time and I did, so I could really get to know people um, in a sort of, I don't know, quiet way. I mean, not, not in the sense that, you know, with a, you're not there with a microphone saying, I need a quote right now. Um, I did, I went out, when I first started working on the book, it was actually a, a 10 year anniversary walk along the Highway of Tears. Um, so the first walk that had been done in 2006, um, so over the course of about three weeks, families walked the entire 725 kilometers from Prince Rupert to Prince George into a symposium that was a meeting of a whole bunch of different agencies uh, and communities and family members and politicians. And it was meant to, to come up with recommendations that would stop the highway of tears, stop the killing and stop the violence. Uh, so 10 years later, there were some family members that got together and they wanted to do another walk uh, on a, the anniversary to bring attention back to these recommendations and back to these issues because 10 years later of 33 recommendations, I, I don't think there was a single one that had actually been implemented. Um, so that was one of my first sort of, you know, really being out working on this book was uh, being able to do this entire walk with the families, visit every community and, and just meet people and just tell people who I was and, you know, what I was hoping to do and find out their thoughts, get people's advice um you know and invite people to take part if they wanted and and i mean virtually everybody that that i met on that walk you know eventually decided that they did want to which was really really wonderful um and i mean it, that's why the book you know became what it is 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 because of it it's the effort of many 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 people um putting this putting this work together and commemorating you know these women and girls and their families Since the pandemic, how many times have we said, oh, I'm muted <laughs> or, oh, you're <laughs> muted. So, but let me I ask you. one conversation where every single time I went to talk, I had muted myself. It was like eight times in an hour. It was terrible. 
Oh, well, we'll just hope that doesn't happen to me. If it's going to happen to anyone, it'll happen to me tonight. But anyway, <laughs> you, you talked about how sometimes um, uh, journalists can exacerbate the, the situation rather than improving. Can you, can you give us some examples of how that works, like what that dynamic is? I mean, we've all seen it, but um, yeah, give it a whirl. Yeah. So, I mean, in these, um, in these stories, when I, a lot of the, I mean, part of the research I did was going back through, I think I got, I got pretty much every newspaper article ever written about any of these cases. Uh, and so there was some really striking things. Um, so, I mean, one was just the really victim blaming language, almost without fail, you know, and describing like a 14 year old that's missing as a, uh, you know, a missing prostitute and just really, really victim blaming um, when, when it even was covered. And then in many of the cases, there was virtually no coverage whatsoever. Uh, and, and that's hugely problematic when someone is missing. And especially when these cases, this is pre social media, this is pre internet, like that's the only way to get the word out really. And, and they weren't covered at all. I came across one letter written by the mother of a missing 15 year old, and it was a letter to the editor. It wasn't an article. And she was begging for help from anybody, from reporters or society or anybody to please help her find her daughter. Uh, and it was just, I mean, it was heartbreaking. So I think there's, there's different ways that the media makes this really difficult. And I guess actually, the, I should say the third way is what often will happen in traumatic cases that do get a lot of media attention. Will there be sort of this just absolute flood of reporters trying to contact grieving families? And I mean, I remember working as a reporter in Toronto and there would be like stakeouts outside the homes of families who just had some terrible thing happen and all reporters and TV cameras and, you know, absolutely hounding families. So. So there's sort of those are the two extremes, but I mean certainly in the highway of tears case is the the extreme for many many years was that there was just absolutely nothing done. And another example of that, and and I think this is I'm trying to lead into the into the conversation about why there is this this response, and uh, if you. Uh, you know, I, I hearken back to the to the uh, statement of the commissioner of uh, the RCMP, um, and this was when I I can't remember exactly the year it was, but it was when they were there was a, a release that there was believed to be about eighteen hundred um, uh, Indigenous women that were either missing and murdered, and even the commissioner of the RCMP, a woman. Uh, was saying that well, it's because of their dangerous lifestyles, and it's really it's really their own spouses and partners who are who are killing them. And you know, and when we think about where does that attitude come from, um, and and this is this is where I want to leap into the concept of the colonial toolkit. And in in previous um, uh, Green College presentations, I've spoken about a book called, uh, no, I forget what it's called. <laughs> um, but it's, um, uh, it's a book about the media and how they are complicit. They have been complicit with the colonial agenda. Um, Seeing Red, that's what it's called. Seeing Red, Natives in, in Canadian Media. And what it does is it outlines how, you know, the role that the media has played in perpetuating the desired perception of Indigenous people, which is that the women are all prostitutes, the men are all drunks, um, you know, they're shiftless and lazy, and, you know, all of those terrible stereotypes that Indigenous people have, have grown up with. And, um, and they, it's a very interesting book because they refer, they refer to uh, the media as curriculum in the sense that that by embracing the colonial agenda, instead of reporting, they're in fact um, they're in fact uh, um, uh, presenting. Um, they're in fact educating the Canadian public 
but yeah. with a false history, with a false, uh, a false perception, with a false notion of what's really happening in terms of Indigenous people. And so this leads me also, then that and that that's a wonderful book, Seeing Red. If any of you, you know, get a chance to pick it up. It came out in 2011, um, but it's still very, very current. And um and it's yeah, it's just a it's just a fantastic piece of work. But this is where I sort of want to go with our conversation today is the relationship between colonialism, allies, yeah. And really, what is an ally? And you know, one of the things that has um, sort of escaped, I think, the Canadian consciousness is the actual reality. Can you hear me okay? Says my internet thing is unstable. Can you hear me okay? Somebody tell me if can you can hear, hear you me okay. I can hear you fine. The video is frozen, but I can still hear you fine. Okay. Okay, as long as you can hear me, you don't need to look at me. I hope I'm just not making a funny face. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, you know, and I, I started thinking about this when I was, uh, you know, researching over the years. And as I continue to immerse myself into, um, uh, into um, the talks that I give to people about residential schools and about you know, the colonial agenda and so on and so forth. And I referred, okay, that's okay. I'll, I'll carry on because she can pick up when she gets back. Um, so I, I think about a letter that came from uh, Dr. Peter Bryce, who was the chief medical officer of the Department of Indian Affairs. And he was, um, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but not really. He, he was commissioned to do a study of the health conditions in the residential schools right around the turn of the century. And what happened um, was he came back and he told the Department of Indian Affairs that if, um, that if the Department of Indian Affairs had been making an effort to create a, uh, a mechanism for the successful transference of tuberculosis, then they had done that successfully with the residential school system. And so, <clears throat> and so he got fired for his efforts, for his, his very honorable response of trying to do something to improve the conditions for these children. And he wrote a long piece, an essay called A National Crime um, in the Ottawa Citizen in right around, I think it was 1907, um, anyway, within a couple of years of, of that particular date. And what he did, one of the things that he said in that in that letter is he referred to um, indigenous people. He said, this is no way, this is no way to treat our Indian allies. And you have to remember that, you know, at the time Indian was the word. So it wasn't said as, as something derogatory. But what fascinates me about that statement is the word allies. That term is bandied around in present day Canada with gay abandon. <laughs> um, and it's, um, um, but I like to think of it in that, that historical sense, because when we turn our mind to this question and we think about allies, if we go back far enough in Canadian slash American history, the military alliances between non-Indigenous, you know, the British and the French um, and various Indigenous groups pl played a phenomenal role in defining the geography of this country. They were allies. The Indigenous people were allies to the French and the English, just as much as Canada was an ally to the Brits in the, you know, in the First and Second World Wars. And so when you begin to think of it in that sense, if you, you begin to think of that as, you know, that, that, uh, that solemn loyalty that allies have for one another, then you begin to wonder, so what is the role of a non-Indigenous ally? What is meaningful allyship, if you will, in the 21st century? And my, my feeling about this is that it has become quite fashionable to, um, uh, 
to to raise your voice, send a tweet, do a post on Facebook, you know, wear an orange shirt. <laughs> but when you think about how in how um, intensely Indigenous people um, embraced their roles as allies, it was the during the First and Second World Wars, the number of Indigenous people that um, signed up was phenomenal in terms of the percentage, the percentage they represented of their overall population uh, compared to the percentage of non-Indigenous people and their population and them signing up. They signed up in droves. They went overseas and overseas and they died in droves. And there are lots of quotes from Indigenous veterans, especially the, the really, really old folks, some of many of whom are no longer with us, and their response. And, and so you have to think about the era of the First World War, 1918-ish, and the era of the Second World War, uh, you know, up to 1945-ish. And you have to think about what was being done to Indigenous people by non-Indigenous Canada by the colonial governments and the, you know, newly, um, the newly minted, uh, um, you know, Dominion of England, Dominion of Canada. And what was happening was some of the most intense violence against Indigenous people in terms of um, removing uh, by law and policy uh, the, the, uh, the hallmarks, if you will, of, um, of nationhood. When those allied relationships were existing back then, when, when these North America and, well, when the US and Canada were becoming the US and Canada, it was the relationship between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people was a nation to nation relationship. It was a relationship of equals. In, through the activities, through the uh, um, the uh, the objectives of colonialism, which is basically to get us off the land, and you know, so that the resources could be exploited fully for settlers. Um, even though that was happening, and we began, we had we were well into the era of the highest statistics of of addictions, of suicide, of, you know, uh, death, early death of children, um, all of those kinds of things. Even then, even in spite of the, um, the intense abandonment by our allies, that is the non-Indigenous people, Indigenous people stood up, went to war and died for the loyalty of their, um, their commitment as allies. Now that's what we need to see. That is the uh, intensity of allyship that is going to um, that is going to uh, uh, effect meaningful change. And that's the thing about reconciliation. And you know, Jessica and I <laughs> miss her already. Um, have talked about this at length about how reconciliation is more so much more than apologies and um, you know, short-term funding project. It is much, much more than that, excuse me. And it simply cannot occur. It cannot take effect until we first have truth. And there has been a phenomenal resistance to truth in this country. And only recently when there can be no denial, okay? There can be no, the evidence is so intense that it can't be denied, and of course, I'm I'm referring to the discovery of the um, of the unmarked graves right across the country, and uh, you know I can tell you with certainty um, that we've just it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number of remains that that have been located, um, and so I think it's important to say that. Uh, Canada knew about this as early as 1907. Duncan Campbell Scott was responding to Dr. Peter Bryce by saying, yes, yeah, they die faster than they do in their villages, but that's not enough 
to, you know, make us change our plans about um, effecting a final solution. And he was using that term final solution before Hitler was. Um, and, you know, his intention was clear when he stated that he would not stop until there was not one Indian who had not been absorbed into the body politic. And so, and then we look at, you know, let's, you know, so, so it was all known then. He wrote an essay subsequently uh, where he said it was too bad that so many of the kids didn't get a chance to benefit from the education because up to 50% of them died. So if anybody thinks that 6,000 bodies is the, um, is the totality or is anywhere close to the totality, you know, then we just need to look at the, at the records of, uh, you know, what was acknowledged way back then at the, at the turn of the century in terms of the death rate of these children. But zooming forward to 2015 and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, the calls to action under the heading of missing children and burial sites there were six calls to action um, that essentially provided a roadmap for the federal government to begin addressing this very, very disturbing reality of the children that just never made it home. And um, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission asked for the outrageous sum of a million and a half dollars, that is tongue in cheek, um, um, to begin this process of helping helping indigenous communities to uh, do the work to find these children and to bring them home. And uh, Mr. Harper was the, pre uh, the prime minister at the time and he simply said no. But it doesn't just rest on his shoulders. Mr. Trudeau said no too. And it, it wasn't until indigenous people themselves by hook or by crook found the necessary resources to um, to do you know to fund the process of uh, you know being able to, what I forget what the what the technology is called but uh, you know to the ground something ground piercing radar or sonar or whatever it is but anyway to to find the remains of the children and they found over two hundred okay in one effort and so it wasn't until Indigenous people produced the bones, produced the skeletons that finally, you know, <laughs> the rest of Canada is having this moment of, oh, my God, you know, oh, my God, these schools were a life and death experience for these children after all. And, and so when I, when we juxtapose that, when we juxtapose the, you know, the, I guess, degree of devastation that has been wrought on Indigenous people in this country. Um, and we compare that with their ongoing commitment of loyalty as, as meaningful allies. We have to ask, where, why doesn't it go the other way? Why is it that non-Indigenous Canada has not felt um, that deep loyalty, that uh, tremendous responsibility um, to stand in a meaningful way, not just words, not just apologies, not just the orange shirt, but to absolutely insist on justice for your allies, for the, 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 uh, the descendants of the Indigenous people that fought alongside the French or the English to create um, the nation that that we all proudly call Canada our home. Why isn't that degree of loyalty um, and and support not? Why is it not directed towards Indigenous people? That's the question. And um, and so that's what I'm looking for in the world right now. And you know, look at my hair. I'm an optimist, okay? <laughs> but um, that's what I'm hoping that we can combine the notion that reconciliation cannot occur without a real shift, not only in perception, but in, um, I guess, restoring 
the equal dynamic between Indigenous nations and the nation of Canada. That power dynamic must return uh, in order that Indigenous people can um, meaningfully share in the resources of this land and can then become self-sufficient, self-sustaining once again, and then we'll be in a position where we can you know, um, embrace the, the, the principle of the two-row wampum, which was, I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it's a, it's a beaded treaty and it's from the East and it was where it represents two rivers. It's, it's purple dentalia with white two, two rivers on it. And, you know, that you go your way, we'll go ours, that we will mutually respect each other um, and that we will, um, support each other, but we will go our own way. One is not above the other, one does not dominate the other. And so, um, yes, so um, time always so, goes so fast. So that's, you know, you've heard a little bit about what Jessica had to say, and it's unfortunate that the technology has not allowed her to continue to participate, but I hope I've had something meaningful to say. And um, I'd like to just open it up to questions now, if anybody wants to, to comment or have a question or just engage in conversation, now's your moment. Okay, no questions. Michelle, Michelle and everybody, this is this is Mark, Mark Vesey from Green College. Um, just a, a, one possibility. I have a strong hunch that there are people in the room uh, with experience of allyship from one side of an alliance or another. It may be that other people would like uh, just to contribute something about um, their sense of how things these things work when they work. Uh, and that that could be another way of um, of having some useful discussion. So please, it doesn't have to be a question. It can be um, uh, anything, to the, anything to the point, uh, to the points that... Well, here's a question. Um, somebody here says, Michelle, another Michelle, good name, um, says, uh, why do you think Canadians have been so resistant to the truth? Well, because it's a hard truth to swallow. It... Uh, Canada has this international reputation of being the kinder, gentler nation, um, you know, of being, you know, the true North pr proud and free and all of that. And for 130 years, Canada was removing every school aged child from, um, from indigenous communities. Imagine that, right? Just close your eyes and imagine 130 years of no school aged children um, in the community. And then on top of that, those children were being violently brutalized, um, physically, sexually, psychologically. Um, and, you know, and I mean, I'm using the example of the residential schools, but there were other things as well. You know, for example, um, the potlatch laws and the, on the, the coast where uh, Indian traditions, uh, indigenous traditions were outlawed. Um, and it didn't just happen in British Columbia. It happened in the prairies too. The potlatches on the coast were, were rendered illegal. The Sundances, the Sundance ceremonials in, in the prairies were made illegal. What you have here is fascism. This is a racist and fascist approach to, um, and just so deeply violent, so deeply, deeply violent. My mother watched her little friend hemorrhage to death from tuberculosis on the playground. How do you get past that? You know, how do you get past thinking about a little girl who died alone um, because it wasn't important enough to provide her with a safe, um, healthy place to be? And so, you know, and, and Canada, I mean, I don't diss Canada. <laughs> I mean, I, Canada is a beautiful country in so many ways, but um, I think we experience a kind of cognitive dissonance when the absolute brutality is 
is finally exposed and we have to accept that this is um, a meaningful part of our history. And one must confront just in the same way that South, South Africa had to confront apartheid and the impacts of apartheid. And for those of you that don't know, um, the South African apartheid was based on the Canadian reserve system. So, um, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a state of cognitive dissonance. I get responses to my book um, that really kind of demonstrate that. And, you know, good hearted people that, that say to me, I just didn't know, I just didn't know, but, I'll, but now I'll never forget, right? And you have to think or realize that very often they place these schools in very distant locations, um, remote locations specifically, so that nobody would see what was happening there. Um, and, but, you know, the other aspect of this, and I, I think about this a lot, I wrote an essay once called A Tradition of Violence, and, and the premise of the essay is that we are not the only people that have an oral tradition. When you think about the fathers of confederation who were saying things in parliament in response to concerns raised by indigenous people about Indian affairs officials and Northwest Mounted police officials um, uh, taking sex slaves actually, basically of um, you know, very young indigenous girls and um, if you want to read a good book about the history of all of that, try Clearing the Plains by James Daschet. Um, anyway, it's those fathers of confederation saying, oh, don't worry about that. That's their parents just selling them off for a bride price, which, of course, is completely, you know, <laughs> you know, out to left field. But you have to think about. You have to think about. Um, the children of those people, the children of those people who were, you know, so deeply invested in, um, you know, in that perception of Indigenous people. What did those children hear at the knees of those people? What did they learn through osmosis, through, through that type of oral tradition? They learned that Indigenous people were, you know, horrible, right? That we were you know, shiftless, lazy, drunks, blah, 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 all of the stereotypes, that's what they learned. And, and that became woven, that, that deep racism became woven into the fabric of Canadian society um, just as tightly as the national anthem. And, um, and that's not an easy thing to undo, let there be no mistake. This is not an easy thing to resolve, but, you know, it still must be. Um, uh, Wiped. I have another uh, another question here, or, or someone said here. I think it was Harmonious Joan. Harmonious Joan, I love your name. <laughs> um, says I think people are afraid to even say I'm sorry because then they feel they're admitting fault and don't know how to deal with the guilt. Um, you know, and I, you know, Maria Campbell said something quite wonderful. She said. Um, you know, we don't need any more stories. We've got a closet full of stories. We don't need stories, right? What we need is, um, is substantive support, support on the ground. We need, we need the rest of Canada to just stand up and say, we're not taking this anymore. Justice needs to be wrought in this circumstance. That's what to me an ally is, is not someone you know, that, uh, you know, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but, you know, not, not these woke folks, right, you know, that, that just love Indians, okay, but people who are prepared to just say, you know, we can't take this anymore, because you've got the population, you've got the numbers, and you've got the numbers to decide who's sitting in Ottawa, who's sitting in the provincial legislatures, we don't. And, you know, and there comes a time when you just got to say that's it, we're not taking it anymore because that's not who we are as Canadians. We don't, as Canadians, support the subjugation of a people. Um, and then Bella, okay, just 
you know, how can we restore you, uh, equality and mutual respect through allyship on an individual level? Raise your voice, you know, write letters, raise your voice. You know, the, um, even, even the, the, the least powerful person on earth has a voice, you know, and can say something and can demand accountability. You know, don't give up, demand accountability from your political representatives, don't give up. And that's what we've had to do. You know, the burden of trying to achieve some kind of justice has rested on our shoulders, trust me. You know, if it hadn't been for the activism of indigenous people dating back to the beginning of, you know, <laughs> relationships, you know, we would, we would have been disappeared off the lands that, that are our ancestral territories. And so, um, yeah, so it's your turn. Fight, sacrifice, um, acknowledge that your world must change in order to, to achieve a balance or to restore a balance, um, which is what reconciliation is to me. It's restoring the balance. Um, and that means, you know, acknowledging that, you know, you can't just hog all the resources, right? Um, it has to, you know, it has to, it has to be equalized at some point. Um, it's not an easy thing, right? It, there's no, uh, there's no, hello, Richard. <laughs> there's, you know, there's just, there's nothing easy about this. And I think that's one of the things that people need to understand is that, um, you know, and I, I can understand that feeling of helplessness, you know, when you're one person and you're looking at this, you know, this long history of a, um, <laughs> this long history of, of oppression and discrimination and racism, you know, it, it, you know, imagine if it feels overwhelming to you, how it feels to us. And, um, you know, but you just have to just keep trying at every opportunity to uh, to do something meaningful, you know, to, um, you know, make a make a commitment. You know how Amnesty International works with their letter campaigns. Make a commitment every day, you know, that, you know, start a group. And, you know, even if you had 10 people and every day there is a letter that goes to Ottawa that says, why do Indigenous people not have potable drinking water you know those kinds of things um you know if they are intense they they have an impact they absolutely do have an impact and i know they do because i'm old enough now that i can go back in time and i can look at how things were when i first started uh when i was 18 years old working with indigenous organizations and you know as as much as things are still desperate in our communities and in our lives, they're not as desperate as they used to be. Um, you know, it, us, these, these um, traumatized, injured, um, you know, attacked, brutalized people, it was us that managed to get a constitutional amendment that managed to entrench our rights in the constitution. If we can do that, after generations and generations and generations of violence and brutality, what can you do? But it takes organization. And that's what we did. We organized. We did this. What, whatever improvements there are, it was only because we did it. If, uh, you know, nobody's, <laughs> you know, nobody was, you know, from federal or provincial governments was offering anything and saying, well, gee, you know, let's just entrench your rights and acknowledge that you actually are a nation <laughs> or that you have, you know, indigenous title to land or, or those kinds of things. You know, nobody suggested that or offered that to us. We fought, we fought in spite of our, um, you know, deep, deep injuries, politically, socially, individually, collectively, we fought and we did this. So like I say, we can do it. Imagine what you can do if you organize. <laughs> See you, Christy. Christy, sorry you have to run. <laughs> so you, anyway, wait, Tansy. <laughs>
Did I say a few words? Oh, Christian. Yes. <laughs> Great presentation. It's uh, Chechelechas. Um, the question, what can allies do? All the heavy lifting thus far has been on the backs of our people. And as you've described, we're just so diminished. And I reflect on the past, the events of the past week really is a reflection of generations of what has gone on. You refer to, to the Bryce report and there were half measures and there were mixed messages and contradictory messages. And the challenge is for allies to situate themselves in their position as Canadians if they're benefiting from being here, that was not without cost to someone else. And that's an uncomfortable examination, but it's so important. I think, well, I'll, you know, I was interviewed, you know, I was asked to comment on the, the importance of the two words national holiday with respect to truth and reconciliation. And it's important that it is national means it's all Canadians, not just Indigenous people. Holiday, look at the etymology of Holiday is holy day, a day of reflection, a day to remember, not a day off, not a vacation, not a day to go to Tofino and surf. And, Tofino. <laughs> and the mixed messages, you know, that we celebrate because the Human Rights Commission said the money should go to the children who were apprehended. And the federal government, our representatives, not will say will not commit that they won't go to the next level of uh, court action, and yeah. You know, so it is. So we stop having expectations, and that's draining. Cook Stem, I listen to the others. Cook Stem, Richard, thank you so much. Um, you know, and that's that's the reality too. Is the you know when we talk about this systemic racism, right? Um, is that you know you have politicians talking out of one side of your mouth, of their mouth, and then you have the bureaucracy, the Department of Justice, talking out of the other side of their mouth. You have, you know, the politicians going, oh, wearing their orange shirts, you know, every child matters, you know, and then you have the Department of Justice, you know, and this was the same thing with the residential school litigation. You had Harper, you know, his crocodile tears, you know, delivering his stupid apology. And the Justice and I know because I was working at the Department of Justice at the time, you know, fighting residential school claims tooth and nail. Interesting anecdote. Um, the way the residential school litigation started, where there were two groups, one in the Lytton area, St. George's School, and one up in the Yukon. And they approached Indian Affairs for funding for healing, not, you know, to take them to court or anything like that, but to, they were beginning to acknowledge, you know, the deep, deep wounds from residential school abuse and so on. And uh, so they asked just for, I think it was the one in the Yukon, I think they asked for $25,000 to help support a support group that had been um, developed to support survivors. So true to form, <laughs> Indian Affairs took that to the Department of Justice for a legal opinion and said, should we do this? Uh, should we fund this? And the Department of Justice said, no, don't, because it may be perceived as admission of liability, you know? And so, you know, the result of that, the response to that was the commencement of litigation because there was no other alternative but to proceed by way of litigation to, to get some resources so that people could begin a healing process, okay? And it's the same thing that we see with this, uh, you know, this real celebration that the court has basically, you know, kicked the feds in the teeth and said, yes, you're discriminating against, you're discriminating against Indigenous kids that are in, um, that are in foster care because you're paying lower rates for their care. And the government has been for how long is it now, Richard? 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, yes. something yeah. like that. They've been fighting 
um, it's 20, yeah, they've been fighting the, the finding of the, uh, yeah, yeah, they've been fighting years, the finding of the commission. Yeah, it's 20 years. Human rights. It's, sorry, it's, yeah. it's Justice Canada's mantra, three little words, save Canada harmless, no matter yeah. what it costs. And, but, yeah. yeah, okay, okay, so. Um, yeah, so for 20 years they've been they've been fighting. There was a decision rendered by the the Human Rights Commission that said that there was discrimination. And you know, rather than taking you know the high road and saying, "Oh my God, there has been discrimination. Let's fix it," you know, they just continue to fight and they just keep taking it to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next level of court. It's probably going to end up in the Supreme Court of Canada. Cultural loss in the residential schools, the concept of damages for cultural loss ended up in the Supreme Court of Canada. And the, the esteemed Beverly Chief Justice then Beverly McLaughlin um, ran, wrote the decision about whether or not there could be damages for cultural loss. And she said, no, it's not recognized at law. And I was so furious uh, because you know, 10 years later, when the litigation had been concluded, Beverly, Beverly McLaughlin comes up with, um, uh, um, with the statement that residential schools were cultural genocide. So, so, you know, when there's nothing at stake, you know, this justice will stand forward and say, yes, there was, it was genocide. And certainly genocide is recognizable at law. It was just that the court was not prepared to go down that road, right, of acknowledging the damage that was done when little kids had their tongues pierced with needles so they wouldn't speak their languages. That's true. It's true. It's not an urban legend. It's true. And so, you know, <laughs> and uh, genocide, while we're on the subject of genocide, um, the... Um, you know, uh, for those that don't know, and I suspect many of you do, the genocide conventions were developed after the, you know, horrible Holocaust of the Second World War. There are five definitions of genocide. There is no definition that is called cultural genocide. And I really believe in spite of good intentions that, that adding the modifier of cultural um, has the impact of making it seem less than perhaps the Rwandan genocide that involved machetes, but it isn't. In Canada, the genocide is no less violent. It was just done over a longer period of time. So in those definitions uh, of genocide, um, the fifth, de there's five definition. The fifth one is the removal of children from one group to another. Simple as that. That's it. That's the definition. And so thus, those that residential school uh, experience was genocide. And that's what we need to um, acknowledge as Canadians, you know, and half of me, my father was French and English, right? So I acknowledge that half of myself, sort of, even though, you know, my soul identifies entirely as Cree, <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, it's so difficult, so difficult for a country to say we are founded on a genocidal history. And, um, and it's, something, it's something that has to happen. It really is so that we can, um, so we can't heal. And that's what I mean about the truth. That's ultimately the truth is that this was genocide. The colonial agenda ranging from the destruction of, uh, you know, the, the destruction of, of spiritual um, continuity through making our, our ceremonies illegal, through, um, you know, Sir John A. Macdonald instructing his Indian agents to starve out. They kill, how many people know that Regina used to be called Pile of Bones? That used to be the name of Regina. And the bones were buffalo and bison bones. And um, buffalo hunters, bison hunters were encouraged to just randomly kill 
the buffalo and the bison. And they would, they'd be on trains, they'd be shooting buffalo and bison off trains. And the reason for that is because on the prairies, the bison and the buffalo were our food, clothing, and shelter. And so buffalo had been completely decimated. Sir John A. MacDonald um, provided uh, rations. Uh, well, there were rations that were supposed to be a, 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 um, provided as a term of treaty, but also um, for banned into treaty nations that hadn't into, entered into treaty to enter into treaty. And, uh, and so he, would, he gave instructions to withhold rations if uh, Indigenous people were misbehaving or if they were re refusing to enter into treaty, like my ancestor, Chief Big Bear, Mistahi Matsqua. And, um, and it created violent confrontations because our people were starving and Indian agents were just laughing. And, uh, um, you know, whether it's that, whether it's, uh, you know, what was done to our children, whether it was, you know, this is a, this is 500 years more now, you know, of a violence that has been uh, embedded into Canadian society as it pertains to Indigenous people. Um, the next book I'm work, work, working on, this new novel I'm working on, uh, is doing what I did with Five Little Indians, but doing it about another topic and about how, um, how it became acceptable in this country that it's okay to kill and brutalize Indigenous women. And that book that I mentioned earlier, Clearing the Plains by James Daszak, is really, really a tremendous book to, uh, um, to read. And so I think, you know, when it comes down to, I ask all of you to just, you know, sort of at some point, close your eyes and think about what allies, like when we look at Canadian history, what is an ally? When we look at, when we look at current history, look at the hue and cry when dear Mr. Trump was trying to, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> when he was trying to uh, disassemble NATO, right? And the, you know, the treaty alliance that is NATO, right? And just like everybody was like, oh my God, you can't breach a treaty. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to Indian people, it's, it's completely okay because we were rendered, we were rendered by law and policy as less than, as less powerful than. And so it was okay at that point to just simply turn the collective back of Canada on their allies, us. And so that's what I ask. Close your eyes for a minute and just think about, you know, what we do on Remembrance Day, okay, on November 11th, and, you know, how we honour, you know, there's solemn recognition of, you know, the allies, the, the role that allies played in, you know, making the world safe for democracy, if in fact that's what it did. Um, and then ask yourself why that same solemnity doesn't exist with your Indigenous allies, with the, the peoples of this land that played uh, a key role in creating this nation by their, the way they were allies during the French Indian Wars, during the wars between the French and the English, the indig without the Indigenous people, it would have been an entirely different thing. And so, yeah, that's what I ask of you tonight is to just think about that and to think about, um, let that fuel you, let it annoy you, let it make you mad and, and then do things like I'm suggesting, right? Like letter writing, start a little group, write letters, don't give up, speak up, be annoyed, you should be. Because, you know, this, this colonial initiative is being done in your name. You know, these, um, these brutalities that were inflicted on us were done in your name. And as Richard says, we know, you know, everybody knows that, you know, you didn't steal my land. <laughs> None of you were around when, you know, all of that horrible stuff was going on. But non-Indigenous Canada continues to, um, to reap the dividends of what was done in those days. And there has to be a reckoning. 
there has to be um, an acknowledgement of that, that even though um, you may have the best of intentions and the best wishes for the healing of Indigenous people, the life that you're living is on our backs. And uh, not by your intention, right? Not by your intention, but just by, um, just by the function of history, by the function of history. But if meaningful change is going to occur, then that function of history has to change. Um, it has to be acknowledged. And, you know, non-Indigenous Canadians, um, non-Indigenous Canadians need to understand that they have to step off a little bit, you know, that we need a meaningful share of the resources of this country if we are ever going to be self-sustaining, self-supporting, self-determining again, and in a position to do the work we need to be doing. And that work, um, you know, the responsibility of educating non-Indigenous people has been on our shoulders for far too long. And non-Indigenous people need to accept responsibility for their own education so that we can focus inward and do the work that we need to do inward in terms of, uh, but we need resources for that. You know, we need resources to be able to, um, you know, to create the healing, a healing fabric again in our societies, in our communities. And that's all I have to say. Michelle, thank you for a very powerful lecture that you weren't expecting to give. You've more, you have, you have more, <laughs> more than fulfilled your commitment as, as a client lecturer at UBC and at Green College. Thank you. Um, it's, it's ludicrous that Jessica is as close as she is on the island and that we managed to lose her. So um, I think we'll give up trying to get her here by Zoom and we'll bring Jessica McDermott to Green College in person as soon as we can. And we'll live stream that event too, for those who can't be with us. Um, I'd just like to thank you, um, Michelle, and thank Jessica if she's out there somehow able to pick this up. Uh, for, for not quite the two-hander that we were expecting, but nonetheless a very powerful hour or so. And I'd like to thank everyone else too for contributions uh, that they've made to the discussion and remind people um, that there is another uh, conversation in this series uh, the next one is on November the 2nd. Uh, Justice Leonard Marchin, did you want to say any more about that now, Michelle, before you? Yeah, I will. First of all, there was a question. Someone said, I note this is being recorded. Where can you see it? Um, Green College has a YouTube channel and it'll be eventually posted there once we've signed releases and got all that jazz done. So it'll be posted there. Um, yes, our next guest is the Honorable Justice Leonard Marchand. Len is... Um, uh, 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 indigenous from the Okanagan Indian Band in, in the Okanagan area. And he is the first uh, uh, justice on the appeal court bench in British Columbia ever. And Len and I, I call him Leonard to just remind him that I'm older than him. <laughs> and, uh, but Len um, and I worked together starting in the 90s um, uh, representing survivors and then I went to justice and we were on uh, allegedly opposing sides even though I was at justice trying to shake it up and make them do the things that they should do um, and then I went and worked with him at his law firm at uh, Fulton and Company in Kamloops and you know so we worked for cheapers more than a decade more than a decade oh god 15 years um, that we were engaged in that entire residential school uh, process with the class action and with the litigation and so on and so forth. And he uh, was intimately involved in developing the um, independent assessment process, which was the settlement process for the residential schools. Plus, it'll be just fabulous to speak to somebody who um, accomplish this sort of the first indigenous Canada. How absurd is that it's, you know, 2021 and finally, you know, there's, there's representation on that bench. Uh, so it will be, uh, so that'll be happening. Did you say November 2nd? I think that's right. November the 2nd. Yes, that's and right. And then the, yeah. 
And then the following week, it's going to, we're going to have uh, the lovely and fabulous Sheila Rogers from the next chapter on CBC. And she will be having a conversation with me about, um, about Five Little Indians, about, about my novel. And uh, so that should be, and that will be wrapping up this, uh, uh, this year's um, Klein lecture series. So, uh, but I think it'll be, it'll be good. I do my best to make it good. <laughs> so I hope to see lots of you there.